Right, and um, yes, I've uh, just had a long day, went to work this morning and then had a conference call and then I decided, you know what, I'm going to have a bath and try to unwind and see if I can do a video this evening. To be honest, I really didn't feel up to it, but I thought to myself, you know what, quite a few things are happening. It's important to get it out there. I need to have a little bit of discipline. And yeah, sometimes it does take quite a lot of energy and you really have to push yourself sometimes to when you make a commitment. I made, I've made a commitment to do a daily roundup. I might change that now, um, given how I felt today. But, you know, I've pushed myself and I'm here and I'm here for you. So I just wanted to talk about a few things, um, okay, 771 imported cases in China, just as they were getting getting it down and everything was getting low and they kind of stabilised themselves with regard to new cases, they've now had 49 new cases and they were imported from foreigners, I don't know what nationality, I don't know what countries but they claim they came from outside. So they've now put a ban on all foreigners going into China. You can't say you blame them. It's such a lot of work to try and get this thing, you know, under control and then to have it rise again. Um, it can't be good. So, um, and also they'd opened 209 of, I think they've got about 7,000. They could have more. I remember there was a seven in it, but they've got lots of cinemas. And they tried opening 209 over last weekend and they were told to close it down. Apparently they've lost nearly 2 billion in revenue by closing down the cinemas. It kind of brings in the income. So they weren't too happy about that. But maybe it was a bit too premature to um, start having people go to the cinema so soon. I mean, I think when when you hear that the numbers are going down and there's no new cases, it kind of makes you have a sigh of relief and you want to get back to normality as soon as possible. It's not possible. It's not that easy. The transition back to normality is going to be a very slow one. And China is way ahead of us and we're just behind. So if you're thinking about December, January, February, March, April, we're now in April, so it's just over three months, and they're still not there yet. We have to think for ourselves. We're just starting. We're not going to be out of this until maybe after the summer holidays for school. Um, and even then, we don't know what's going to happen. So um, what else was there? Children, as of Friday, was it? The 29th of March. Children cannot accompany their parents shopping, apparently in supermarkets. Apparently because of the social distancing um, rules, um, children can't accompany, um, can't accompany their parents. So we have to keep them at home. They have to um, take into consideration, just like everybody else, that there has to be a certain distance. And yes, it must be really difficult for parents who don't have carers or who don't have anybody to leave their children with but um, I'm not quite sure how they're going to work that one out. But apparently, there um, a lot of the supermarkets are banning children um, for the shopping. What else? Um, bailiffs, they can't isolate, evict you if you're self-isolating. Honestly, yesterday, oh, I had tears down my eyes. Um, there was an elderly couple, apparently worked all their lives. I think they must have been in their 70s. And... Um, because I, I don't know it, what kind of job he had, but he had lost his job and she had, the two of them were on universal credit and the universal credit wasn't giving them enough to pay their rent. So they were behind and the bailiffs came and, you know, he still had a sense of humor. He said he didn't know where he was going, but they're doing his, they're doing their job. But I was just thinking um, when I was watching it, and they have to get in such close... This, of course, was filmed before the coronavirus um, outbreak. But I would imagine that that is probably why um, the, the deferment of eviction has been deferred until June, because I would imagine that bailiffs can't go in people's houses while they're self-isolating, and why, you know, and get up close and personal with people who might have the coronavirus. So... Um, 
Yeah, so a few people might get a little reprieve up until June um, with regard to bailiffs. Um, Czech Republic, um, they were saying that the mask is not a gimmick. That's how they've managed to keep their, um, their figures down. You know, a lot of people, they feel embarrassed by the mask or they think mask is a gimmick or they think it's unnecessary, um, that kind of thing. But to be honest, everybody should wear a mask. OK, the government says or other, I don't know if it's the government, but people say that if you wear a mask, uh, it's not going to protect you. It's not going to protect you from other people who... Um, who might have the coronavirus. But the fact of the matter is, it might not protect you from other people. But if other people wear a mask, if they have the coronavirus and you have a mask on and they have a mask on, it, it will stop it from spreading. So in, in fact, like how it was in China and Italy, everyone should be ordered to wear a mask because that is, the, that is one of the main ways of stopping it from spreading. So when people wear masks, I think they think it's protecting them, but it's not. So if somebody else has got, if somebody else has got it, now if, if somebody's got the coronavirus and they have a mask, that will prevent it from spreading to someone else. But, so it makes sense if everybody wears a mask, even those who have coronavirus, they will keep it to themselves because it will get absorbed in the mask. And then you will be safe. But if the people who don't have the coronavirus have a mask on and those who do have the coronavirus are not wearing a mask, it defeats the object. So um, what they're saying in the Czech Republic is everybody should wear a mask. And that makes sense to me. Um, oh, what about those people? 1,400 people stranded on the, the, the cruise ship Zandam. Is it called Zandam? Yeah. Just going from country to country and being rejected because of the lockdown. Can you imagine? They just finished a two-week cruise that was supposed to stop on the 21st of March. And they cannot get off because who are the countries? Um, Chile's rejected them, Peru has rejected them, and Argentina. They went on a cruise around South America. So now they're heading for Florida, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And they're saying in Florida, they're not accepting them. They, can't, they haven't got the resources to take 1,400 people in. So these people are just kind of in the sea, just looking for a place to dock and get off. And the pe the, apparently um, two people have died. Nine people have tested positive. 179 others are experiencing flu-like symptoms. So you know 300 of them are Americans and they can't be... I don't understand why they can't at least take the ones who are not experiencing symptoms off the boat because the way it's going, they'll all develop it and they all could die on that bloody boat in the middle of the, in the, middle of the ocean. How tragic is that? I mean, I understand the logic from these countries, but surely the same way that they take people off of a plane and quarantine them immediately, couldn't they do that? And if one country agrees to take, OK, so Fort Lauderdale can't take 1,400, well, two have died and nine are tested positive, but they can't take 1,400. Can't they each, each country take about 400 each? and quarantine them and leave them somewhere, get those tested so those tested can go off about their business and go home to their loved ones. And those ones who test positive are um, put in isolation or quarantine or something. But to have them aimlessly on a boat, and that boat's... I don't know what boats run off of, but isn't it going to run out of whatever it runs off of? I don't know what it runs off of. But it must be really scary to be, you know, when you think you're going to go for two weeks and you're going into the third week now and you just want to go home. And like those people who've used up all the resources, I mean, normally those cruises, I think they're all inclusive and they reckon that the ship staff are being really, really 
good. You know, they're playing games and they're having trying to have fun. But you can imagine inside how people must be nervous that no one's accepting them. Who would have thought how things change within a couple of weeks? I was looking at some of my videos and seeing when this coronavirus thing started because I was trying to think, well, I wasn't even going to talk about coronavirus, but you can't help it because that's all there is. You know, they, you can, they throw in a little bit about this and that in between it all, but it's just monopolising our lives. So you can't really get away with it. But I, like I said, I'm, I'm staying away from the fear mongering. I'm trying to give you facts and news that I think might be interesting and of use. So um, what else is there? Trump says we're battling the plague. I was watching his um, his talk. I think it was yesterday or was it live this morning? I can't remember. But he says we're battling the plague. This was the coronavirus and US task force daily briefing. And he was saying it's incredible that gas has gone down to 99 cents a gallon. But what point is that? And he said people must be happy and glad. But what point is that? They can't go out and get any gas because they're not allowed to drive. Oh, that man sometimes. Sometimes he talks, and he talks so eloquently. I mean, people say he's a dodo, but no, he's not. Sometimes he talks so eloquently, but sometimes it's like his brain slips, and he says things that are just totally off the wall. So there's no point people enjoying the fact that oil has gone down, that like their gas and petrol have gone down to 99 cents if people can't drive around in their cars and use it. Um, what else? And he also said it can help airlines. But if airlines can't bloody fly and ain't going anywhere, how does it help the airlines? Oh, I don't know. Um, hospital ships are on their way. They've got a hospital ship in New York because New York are, are crying out for ventilators. There's not enough ventilators. Trump is saying that, look, you know, we're sending out um, ventilators to who needs it. And it's up to Trump, it's up to FEMA, who gets, the, and, and some other um, senior officials, who gets the ventilators. But they determine the value of life. They determine where those ventilators go. They determine which districts, which, you know. And so I don't know what's going on. He seems to think that um, government Governor Cuomo has enough ventilators. And apparently, Governor Cuomo is saying he's, they've got to bid against each other. All these different districts, who's going to get ventilators? So I don't know what is going on with that. Um, what else have I got here? Compassionate use of drugs is where a new and unapproved drug is used to treat a seriously ill patient when no other drugs are available. So apparently there is this, um, you know, they're talking about um, hydrochloroquine or however you pronounce it. Um, that isn't a compassionate drug, by the way. They reckon it definitely, well, they say it works, but it's not tested. So they can't say it works and it needs to undergo clinical trials. So I don't know because there's there's quite a few doctors who say it does work. But, you know, you'd think that they'd jump on the bandwagon and get, instead of getting lots of ventilators, get lot, gets lots of, these, of this bloody medication that saves people's lives. But, you know, as far as they're concerned, it's not tested and they want to test these um, they want to do these trials and vaccinations or whatever they're, they're called and testing. They prefer to do that with the time. And every day the time is passing, the numbers of deaths increasing, and um, we're no better off. I mean, people are starting to panic. I mean, at that conference where he was today, I mean, people, you could tell people are getting agitated. I don't think it's quite dawned on them that, you know, they're trying to talk to him in a rational way, but this is not a rational situation. And the way they are handling it is not, it will not seem rational to the people who don't understand what's happening and how it's happening so fast. 
I mean, their logic is, you know, they're saying, oh, why didn't you do something when you first heard? You waited so long and blah, blah, blah. He's saying, well, I'm, I'm an optimistic man. I'm trying to be optimistic. I didn't want to frighten anybody. So therefore, I told people that it would go away. I didn't realise that it wouldn't go away. But, you know, I'm optimistic. I don't want to be the bearer of bad news. But you're going to be the bearer of bad news sooner or later. It's better that you tell people how it is and then they can psych themselves up for it. And you do something about it when you know, as opposed to saying, oh, yeah, it's going to pass. Don't worry about it. And then now when you've got so many deaths and they're increasing, you're saying, oh, well, I didn't want to frighten you. I'm an optimistic man. It doesn't make any sense. People, that's not going to wash with people. So, um, so yeah, they're still talking about the vaccinations that might give an efficacy signal, which is where, although you have no proof that the vaccine works, you get enough information to get it approved by the US FDA um, in an emergency. And um, the testing is to ascertain if patient has been infected or is safe to return to society. If health workers have had the virus and can go back to work, they need to know the total rate of infections to see if social distancing and other policies have been affected. So that's why they say they're testing. And there's two types of tests. One's not so reliable. WHO say that a negative test does not rule out whether or not you have the virus. So if that's the case, what is the point? I mean, it's almost like um, on the one hand, they're saying, oh, yeah, they're going to do all these tests to see if you have the virus. But then it's almost like they're saying that even though you've tested and you don't have the virus, you test, they've tested you and you don't have the virus, that those those tests are not conclusive. So it, me it probably means you have to undergo another test. It's almost like they want to kind of up the ante. To, I, I, I just don't get it. Either, what is the point of having these tests if they're not conclusive? Putting people through all these tests and they're not conclusive. You don't mind going to a test if it says, okay, you've got it or you don't have it, or you've had it, and you've got over it. Both. Tick that one off. You can go about your business. But when you're saying, okay, you can have a test, but once you've had the test, oh, well, um, that doesn't mean you're not that doesn't mean you're not negative. That, you, you could really still be negative, which probably means later down the line, you've got to have another test to see if you really, really, really are negative. It's absolutely, it's absolutely, it's unrealistic. And to me, it's just wasting time and money and people, it's just delaying the whole process. But that's just my humble opinion. Um, they have genetic tests, which are slow but accurate. There's three types. Um, the genetic tests, they look at the individual's DNA and identifies the genetic differences contained in the sample to ascertain whether it is susceptible to a particular disease or abnormalities. Now... <clears throat> I don't like the sound of genetic testing. I don't like the sound of that at all. But anyway, um, I guess if you test people with different DNAs, it's going to tell you why does one, per, one, why does one type of DNA respond to it in this way and why does another type of DNA respond to another person in a different kind of way. Because this is what it's all about. It's like playing God. What are the differences in people? What is the genetic differences? What makes one person a more, res a more resilient than another person? What? And it's testing those boundaries. Well, that's what I think. I don't know. The thing is with scientists and people in medicine, you know, they are so curious. It's it's their job, you know, that they need to find answers. And so they test and they examine and they go and investigate and they go back and forth and back and forth, testing, testing, testing. And the only way they can test is to use people as scapegoats to see what works against it and what doesn't. And if it doesn't work against it, okay, we'll try another thing. I used to work in a hospital about 10 years ago. And I remember one of the um, consultants saying, 
oh, well, we'll try, you can try that one. And if that doesn't work, you can try this one. These are palliative people. But what I'm saying is, is that it's just like, OK, if this one doesn't work, that one should work. And if that one doesn't work, we'll try something else. Why can't they just get something that works? Instead of testing, testing, testing all the time. And I understand that you can't know if something works unless you test it. But then have a small, um, what do you call it? Those little groups that people have, like a pilot group. You know, and test it on a pilot group who's volunteering or whatever. And then you can kind of, whether it's up or whether it's good or bad or ugly, you kind of get an idea. But it's almost like, you know, like even if you go to the doctors and they say, OK, um, we're going to give you this medication. And if this medication doesn't come back and tell us if this medication doesn't work or if you have adverse symptoms to it. And then, OK, if, some, if somebody has adverse symptoms, I say, OK, well, we'll change you. We'll take, take you off of that and we'll give you something else. It's like birth control. You try different types of birth control. And OK, that one works. That one that one makes, makes you bleed all the way through the month. That one does something else. And so that one makes you fat. This, another one makes you lose weight. Another one heightens your blood pressure. And, and you, you play around with those um, those. They're not medications, but you play around with the um, birth control until you find one that suits a, that particular individual. It's the same thing. When they're having these vaccines and antibody tests and antigen tests and all those things, they are trying to find out what exactly works. But in the meantime, everybody's a scapegoat. So, you know, but if they're not a scapegoat, how do they know that they work? So it's just like, you know, I don't know the answer. I really don't know the answer. Anyway, these tests, they take the form of a swab in the throat <coughs> or the nose. It's a long tube like a, um, you know, like those cotton buds things. It's like a long thing and it goes all the way up and down your throat or wherever it goes. And you have a swab test, or there's a blood test, or there's one where you cough up, cough up sputin. And these tests can only tell you if you currently have the virus, not if you've had it in the past. And if you've just caught it, and if you've just caught it, oh, and if you've just caught it, it might show you a false negative result. So they all have different roles. These tests have different roles. One will tell you if you've had it, one will tell you if you've had it and got over it. One will tell, tell you that you haven't had it at all. And uh, I just don't know. <clears throat> the antibodies test is quick, but it's not accurate because it can tell you if you've had the virus and have recovered it from it. But it picks up the antibodies, but it doesn't pick up the virus. What is the point? I just feel as though we're all sitting ducks. That's how I feel. Anyway, um, there was something <laughs> changing the subject a little bit. Well, we're still on coronavirus, but just changing the subject a little bit. Apparently, um, there was something going around that if you sneeze, it can fly 27 feet. But Dr. Anthony um, Fauci, he, was, he had to kind of clarify what he meant. He reckons if you give a vigorous sneeze, like, ah, chew, really, really vigorous, that could technically fly 27 feet. 27 feet, that's a bloody long distance. Well, the aerosol droplets can actually throw 27 feet because somebody was asking, if it can fly 27 feet, then is a six feet um, social distancing criteria are still valid but he was saying no it's it's very unusual for somebody to be able to sneeze to that degree where it actually reaches 27 feet so technically you should be okay by six feet because most people go 
do it in their hands, then they there's nothing there, so they don't wash their hands. They shake your hand, or they touch the door, or they touch the kettle. Bob's your uncle. You don't even have to be six feet, do you? Anyway, Farage. Oh, yeah, Farage. I was listening to Farage today. Oh, all of a sudden, he's concerned. He wasn't concerned a couple of years ago, was he now? When he was making all those exaggerated um, posters about how many people were coming into the country. All of a sudden now. Ooh. Because he's impacted by the shutdown, he's talking about, oh, we must say no to house arrest. He's talking about some people, some posh people that went to a place in Derbyshire and how they're putting black ink in the in the blue lagoon and that the police are putting black ink in the blue lagoon and they shouldn't put black ink in, in the blue lagoon to stop people from swimming. And, you know, it's ridiculous. Um, you know, an elderly couple wanted to go and visit their parents and then somebody shot them and told them the police about them and they were they were reprimanded oh yeah it's all right when all the little lo lo the little lowly people are um under curfew and under lockdown but oh not the, not the likes of him he shouldn't be he's oh no say no to home arrest who does he want to say that to who do, who is he trying to rile up you bloody say no to home arrest. Stop trying to rile up people and cause problems when you are the one that thought, oh, what a wonderful idea. But you didn't think it would affect you, did you? And now it's affecting you. You don't like it. Well, tough. It's affecting everybody. You stay locked down in your house. He's going, I'm not going to stay locked down. I'm going out. He's a smoker, he reckons. And he's and he's he's high risk. And somebody shopped him as well. Somebody told somebody that he was out. That's why he's peed off. Good. Apparently they have a hotline. The police have a hotline and you can call it if your neighbour has gone out more than once. So if you haven't got a good neighbour, love, they can shop you. And they can say to the police, call that call the police, oh that lady or that man went out twice today. Because you're only supposed to go out once. They don't say that, but you're supposed to go out once. Don't worry, it was it would all soon be done uniformly. It would all soon be done legislatively. Right now, people are still a bit unwary. Like I was watching, I, I went to work this morning, and I was watching this boy and girl walking up and down the street, and I was watching somebody cycling, and I was thinking, okay, they're following protocols, but soon. If they have martial law or something, you won't be able to be walking for more than 30 minutes. I don't know how far they were working, walking. Well, apparently they're, it would be jogging for 30 minutes and walking for an hour. And then in worst case scenarios, they can actually shut it down. So you only go out for three hours over three days. All depends how extreme they want to be. All depends how bad this coronavirus ends up being and how stringent they want to be, how strict. That's what it depends on. So, what else is there? Michael Gove. Oh, it's Michael Gove that's saying a daily jog should be confined to 30 minutes. So they're already starting. And a daily walk should be confined to an hour. They're starting. And do you notice it, it's slowly, slowly, a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, they're pulling in the reins, they're pulling it all around. You know, they can barricade, they can barricade, they can barricade areas as well if they want. They can barricade areas and then they have checkpoints and you have to have a government pass almost to say you are allowed like a, a travel pass that you are allowed out for, whether it is to go to your job and during the curfew period, why you're out outside the curfew period. Do you, can you imagine that? I mean, you think this is bad. If it gets to the point where it becomes martial law, I mean, right now you still have a, a you know, you have a relative amount of freedom or a sense of freedom in the sense that 
you know, at least you know you can go out once a day, you know you can go and get your shop. I think you can get your shopping once a day and you can do your little walk for 30 minutes or an hour or do that bit. But if it gets a bit heavy with this, you know, people are dropping dead like flies, you're going to be curtailed and you're not going to be able to go out like you think, like you want. No, you're not. So, um, so in a worst case scenario, what would martial law, especially in USA, look like? Because it would probably take off there first. Um, civil rights and democracy are suspended. You don't have no rights under martial law. It's all suspended. Democracy is suspended. So you can't go out with your little banner saying no, no to martial law. You can't do that. You can't say, oh, let's unite and let's go and walk up to Downing Street. No, you can't do that. You have to keep your ass put. Because anyhow you come out under more martial law, it's no joke. So <clears throat> the military will enact law and order and they will have police and judicial powers. So it's no longer the police. We thought the police were nasty. Mm -mm -mm -mm. There'll be baby feed. So, and then installations of curfews could be like, for example, from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. So if you're out on the street after 9 p.m., or it could be three hours every third day, what would you prefer? You won't have a choice. And so what will happen is... <clears throat> People, if you are stopped, you be invest. You won't, well, not inter. Well, kind of interrogated. You'll be asked questions and this and that, and you have to prove this and prove that, and then you'll be issued with a special transit document that will allow you to go to and from your place of work. It will allow you to get to hospital if you need to get to hospital. Um, but these would need to be approved in advance. So, like, I'm I'm still going into work. I would need to, if it came to England, say, that I would need to apply, I would assume, for one of these transit documents. But hopefully by the time all this happens, I'll be working from home, you know, and everything will be hunky-dory, let's hope. But if it, if it doesn't, if somebody, well, let, let's not talk about here. Let's talk about America. So, but in America, if it reaches that point, they'd have to have a transition document. And that would give them license to be out on the street, outside the curfew hours, <clears throat> outside the curfew hours. And documents will be specific, letting the authorities and armies know where you are allowed to go and when. These documents will indicate whether you are in violation of travel restrictions or curfew. So everybody will be carrying around a little document if you're on the street. I doubt if anybody will be on the street at that rate. You, I mean, you always have a few little rebellious people who are going to try try it, like Farage. I wonder if he would try it. If there was a martial law in the UK. I bet he's got all this now, but I think he's trying to rile up other people. I don't think he's got the balls to do it himself. I think he's just trying to rile up other people. If he, if he um, had the balls to do it himself, he would be walking up and down the street instead of sitting in his house. He would be out on the in this open field doing his video rather than locked up in his house. So in extreme cases, neighbourhoods could get barricaded. Um, there's a restriction of movement and security checkpoints. It's a bit like when I went um, to Jamaica and they had, um, what do they call it, state of emergency. And every now and then you had to stop because the police were in the road and they were checking. Well, they weren't really checking documents. They were checking to see who was in the car. So um, social distancing is six feet from any individual. Different methods to get you to that point. I don't know what that is. When people are isolated, we cannot tell if people are sick, being mistreated or being taken away. Oh, yeah, I was just thinking. 
you know, like when people, you know, like the elderly are isolated. I mean, they're supposed to be on isolated for 14 weeks. We don't know if they're being mistreated. We don't know if, you know, they're just being taken away. We don't know what's happening because there's nobody to watch over them. Um, and because you can't go to the hospital, there's, you can't inquire about them. All, all you hear is that, OK, they died. And then you're going to assume it's related to COVID ID. We, COVID-19, we, you know, I just think it's a bit, um, you know, unfair. I don't know if it's unfair is the right word. But to have people isolated like that and then, you know, so many people who I heard live alone or who are self-isolating, you know, they're dying. And, you know, it's it's like there was nothing wrong with them before. They're all of a sudden they're dying. Well, I shouldn't say there's nothing wrong with them. You know, they look as though they're pretty healthy. I mean, I know a lot of people, they walk around as though they're healthy and they have underlying symptoms. You know, I'm aware of that. But you just don't know why, you know, people are dying so rapid well like i said you know everything's blamed on the corona uh, coronavirus now anybody gets ill and anybody dies it's all of a sudden it's coronavirus related it could be fluid well it could be anything really but it will be related to, but there's something i read what's i oh no 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 something totally different okay so second wave of pandemic that is supposed to come within six months to a year. I don't think they're going to let it wait. Well, not they that are going to let it wait. I don't think it's going to wait for longer than a year. Normally, they come in quite quick succession. Um, and if, it's, if it comes before this um, current outbreak is sorted out or reduced or resolved, it's going to be catastrophic. Um Ah, well, so what can I say? How do I sum up this? Well, basically, it's all about keeping your immune system up. It's looking after yourself. It's, I don't even know, to be honest. I really don't know. I'm just, you do, I just think everything is timing. Because I think, you know, even people are travelling. And we find that people are travelling. I mean, there's um, some boys in Barbados. Yeah, some students in Barbados. They can't get back to Jamaica. And they require counselling. You know, when you think, like, maybe three or four weeks ago, they would have been on, on the plane and back in Jamaica. Everything is timing. If the people... I, I know, like, about four or five weeks ago, a couple of people at work said, oh, they just come back on a cruise. If they'd gone on a cruise just a week or two later... They could be in the same position that those people are on with the boat now, the, the, the cruise ship Zandam. You know, so everything is timing. And that's why it's so, you know, sometimes I think a lot of us, we do get little nudges about when to do things. And sometimes we ignore that little nudge or that little gut feeling and we say, ah, don't worry about it. I'm going to put it off. I don't have to do it now. I can do it next week. And then if only you'd done it then, you would have been in um, a better position. You know what I mean? It's funny because I was going to get um, a door. I, every year I say I'm going to do something new to the house. So I was going to get a door. And then I thought to myself, you know what? It's a bit of an extravagance at this time when so much things are happening. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to cancel that order and I'm not going to bother. But if I hadn't cancelled that order, I, they would have had my money. I mean, I know technically they'd have to refund it, but it would have been like I would, I would have been in limbo because I don't know what the criteria is. You've got 14 days. Those 14 days... No, it's not even 14 days. You have seven days. Those seven days would have been expired. I would have been bound to that contract. And even they could say to me, oh, well, 
it's due to this and that. We can't do your door, but you're bound to a contract. So we'll get to you. To, we'll get to do your door when all of this tides over. And I would have been out of pocket with the deposit and no, and no new door. So everything is timing. And if I hadn't listened to my instinct to cancel and just said, OK, I'm going to wait. And I didn't even know it was seven days, to be honest, because I didn't even look at the contract. But if I had waited one day later, I would have passed that seven days. But I listened to my gut instinct. So all I'm saying is sometimes at times like this, you have to listen to your gut instinct. It's, it's there to guide you. It's there for a reason. Anyway, I've blabbed on long enough. Enough is enough. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.